This video is intended to be a review of the cardiovascular system for non-majors um, with the following premise, uh, that obviously everyone should understand their own bodies. And very often uh, we need to make decisions about healthcare, about a uh, blood tester coming back, and rather than have someone uh, not be aware of the meanings of various uh, terms and of the causes of heart disease, et cetera. It would be far better uh, to you know, be an informed consumer of information so that if you were making decisions uh, in healthcare for yourself or for a loved one, that you were you know, better understanding some of the tests which were done, uh, et cetera. So this is just a quick overview of some of the basics of the cardiovascular system. I, I teach anatomy and physiology for allied health majors, so I have a lot more videos uh, which go through this in uh, more detail if that is of interest. Um, so first off, we need a cardiovascular system, um, and that's uh, primarily because uh, we need to transport uh, stuff around our uh, bodies. So if you think about, you know, the lungs are the source of oxygen, the digestive system is the uh, source of uh, nutrients, but these have to be transported throughout uh, the body. In the same way, there are waste produced in certain parts of the body or hormones produced, which then have to be transported. And so this cardiovascular system allows transport throughout the body in addition to a few other things, uh, such as regulating, uh, the body so that the temperature uh, stays the same, uh, the ion levels uh, stay the same, the pH stays the same, and then also um, has some degree in protection uh, given that white blood cells can be distributed, clotting factors uh, can be uh, distributed, uh, etc. Uh, there are cells in our blood, um, but we lose them frequently every single second. We're losing millions of blood cells. So that means every single second, millions more must be made. Uh, and this is occurring in the red bone marrow. Now, when we were fetuses, uh, the, uh, blood could be made at a few other parts of our body, you know, the yolk sac, the liver. When we were infants, all bones had some red bone marrow. Um, but now um, our red bone marrow, which is making uh, the red blood cells, um, it's a limited uh, portion of our body. So uh, some of our flat bones, like uh, the sternum and uh, flat bones of the skull, some of our irregular bones, uh, such as um, the vertebrae and the hip, and um, the proximal ends of the arm and leg, so where the humerus and uh, the femur uh, meet uh, the girdles. Uh, this is where we find uh, the red bone marrow. Um, much of the rest of our uh, uh, bone marrow is yellow marrow that stores adipose, which could temporarily become a red bone marrow uh, should we uh, need it. Now, the reason that uh, this is so important uh, is that uh, it is here that something known as uh, hematopoiesis occurs. Uh, so hematopoiesis is the process of cells specializing and deciding who they want to be when they grow up. And so if we give the right hormone, like erythropoietin, that tells the cells of the bone marrow, we're short on red blood cells and we need more. And so the cells of the bone marrow, they specialize. You know, they do things like eject the nucleus, et cetera, and they produce uh, the red blood cells, or are called erythrocytes, uh, which will then enter uh, circulation. Um, but we could provide different hormones uh, and end up with uh, the white blood cells, which we need. And as we'll see, there's different kinds of white blood cells like neutrophils uh, or um, uh, using uh, the hormone thrombopoietin, we can tell uh, these bone marrow cells that we're short on platelets, which have roles in blood clotting. And so in the bone marrow, uh, these uh, uh, precursor cells become very big and uh, they make lots of clotting factors and then break into lots of little pieces, uh, each of the pieces being uh, a platelet. And so then the things that we find in our um, blood, the uh, red blood cells, the white blood cells, and the platelets, uh, thus were made in uh, the red, um, uh, in the red bone marrow. Um, now, one can uh, see the components of blood by spinning it what's, you know, or centrifuging it. You would actually get the same results if you just let it sit for a while. But if you sit, spin blood, the heavy stuff sinks to the bottom. And therefore, you get what's called plasma uh, up top. This is 
uh, a cell-free liquid. It's mostly water, but it does have uh, some proteins in it. So that's the plasma. Um, uh, you would then get uh, uh, a thin layer called the buffy coat, called being buffy because it's an off-white in color, where your platelets and white blood cells are found. And then the hematocrit layer uh, is what you find uh, at the bottom. And uh, this is where the red blood cells uh, are found. Now, all of these are important. And so sometimes, you know, people, you know, donate uh, their uh, plasma uh, or are donating red blood cells. And if you do a a double uh, red blood cell count, then the plasma has to be returned uh, to uh, your body. And so in blood donations, this is important. Now, uh, one of the reasons one would uh, consider this is because the various percentages uh, that one finds in these various elements can vary. So for example, the amount of blood, which is your red blood cells, that can vary. Now, it's good to have red blood cells, but the more red blood cells you have, what's called a, the higher your hematocrit, um, you, the thicker your blood and the harder it is to pump. So uh, blood is a bit thicker in uh, men uh, because testosterone causes more erythropoietin uh, to be uh, made, which then uh, increases uh, more red blood cells. And then whether it be genetic disorders, such as those causing uh, polycythemia, problems with the lungs like COPD, or then even artificial ways of increasing red blood cells, such as blood doping or erythropoietin use of the use of anabolic steroids. This would all increase the um, red blood cells having the advantage of now uh, giving the blood uh, the ability to carry more oxygen, uh, but the disadvantage is it's thicker and now harder to pump. Uh, men need higher blood pressure to circulate their blood. One of the reasons that heart disease incidence is higher uh, in uh, men. Um, uh, some individuals have a hematocrit which is too low. It's a little lower in women, um, but also after say hemorrhage or kidney disease, it goes down. <coughs> as it does in the various causes of anemia. Some causes of anemia are uh, genetic, um, but then sometimes uh, it's because of a poor diet, a lack of iron in diet or protein in diet, which means one can't make as many uh, red uh, blood cells. Um, so uh, red blood cells uh, uh, make up the majority of uh, the cells in blood, but there's so many of them. Not only are they 99% of the uh, cells that one would encounter in uh, blood, um, but they're almost a quarter of the cells that one has in one bo one's body. So look here, almost all of the cells here are red blood cells, except for that one white blood cell we just saw, or the occasional platelets, the little purple smudges here. So you have an enormous number of red blood cells in uh, your body. Um, and the reason for that is uh, all, you know, or, uh, you know, all vertebrates need oxygen, but we mammals, especially we primates, we're warm blooded. Uh, we have big brains and we walk upright. We need an incredible amount of oxygen. And thus, as you know, we power this active metabolism, we produce lots of carbon dioxide. And it is then these red blood cells, which are then transporting these gases. They take oxygen from our lungs to our body's uh, tissues. And then they take uh, uh, the carbon dioxide in our tissues and they bring it back to our uh, lungs. Now, they, uh, there's a couple ways that carbon dioxide can travel. Red blood cells directly transport some carbon dioxide and they help other uh, molecules of carbon dioxide become bicarbonate, uh, which then allows them uh, to, um, uh, to transfer. Uh, the red blood cells, uh, they have a modified shape um, because uh, of the nucleus uh, being ejected in uh, the bone marrow. So part of the process of specialization as cells become red blood cells is they eject their nucleus, which gives them this flat biconcave shape. Thus, they have more surface area so that uh, gases, uh, oxygen, and carbon dioxide can go back and forth uh, more efficiently. Uh, that also makes them more flexible so they can fit through uh, narrow uh, capillaries. And not only do they eject their nucleus, but they also eject uh, their mitochondria. 
the mitochondria are the part of the cell that uses oxygen. So we can trust that our red blood cells are very efficient transporters of oxygen because they actually ejected the uh, parts of the cell which use oxygen. So when I inhale, then red blood cells are uh, binding the oxygen I've inhaled and they can transport it to my brain, my muscles, et cetera. And then when my brain and muscles build up carbon dioxide, red blood cells can help uh, bring uh, this back to, um, back to the lungs uh, where it can uh, be uh, exhaled. Um, now, uh, our uh, hematocrit, uh, I can uh, measure once again uh, the levels of red blood cells, uh, which is an important diagnostic feature. But if we were to spin blood down, or you know, we can count uh, blood cells in other ways, we could also get an idea of the white blood cell count. So notice that in a normal individual, uh, there's a certain amount of white blood cells that you can see in the buffy coat uh, there. Um, but you can spin blood down uh, and get a total uh, white blood cell count. Uh, one could also do this if you burst the red blood cells and you counted the cells which remain. And you could then notice that, you know, the white blood cell count uh, can be elevated, you know, and that then is indicative of something such as an infection or uh, leukemia. So not only is it good to know uh, about, you know, how the body normally works, um, but then there's all of these diagnostic tests which give you information about what's going wrong uh, in uh, the body. Um, so white blood cells can be stained and uh, we realize that there are different kinds of uh, white blood cells. Uh, some have granules inside that take up stains. We call them granulocytes. Um, uh, there are these neutrophils uh, which have irregularly shaped nuclei and then lilac granules. There are eosinophils, which have uh, uh, take up a red stain and um, have larger granules. And then there are basophils, uh, which uh, take up a dark purple stain. So these three types of white blood cells are called granulocytes because the, uh, they have granules which take up stain. And then we have these large monocytes and smaller lymphocytes. These are called agranulocytes. They don't take up uh, stain. So we have different kinds of white uh, blood cells uh, in our uh, bodies. And the reason for that is uh, white blood cells protect our bodies. And just to make a societal comparison, if you ask what parts of uh, society uh, protect us, you know, we could say there's an army, a navy, an air force, and marines. There's a coast guard. There's state troopers. There's a CIA, an ATF, an FBI, campus security at your college, local police, et cetera. There's a long list of you know firefighters, et cetera. Why? Well, because there's a lot of potential dangers. You know, and the reason we have different branches is that a fire, which you know, you know is protected by uh, firefighters, is different from a problem that might you know, face a college campus, which is why campus security might do something. But that's different from the US Navy, for example. There are different types of threats. And so therefore there are different parts of our society specializing in different threats. And the same thing here, your body faces different threats. There's bacteria, there are viruses, there are cancer cells, there are parasitic worms. And so we have these different types of white blood cells. Neutrophils, for example, very good against bacteria. Eosinophils, good against uh, parasitic uh, worms. Basophils, they're uh, mounting an inflammatory response. Lymphocytes, very good at cancer and virally infected cells. Monocytes uh, and the macrophages they become uh, can attack bigger things like yeast cells. Uh, and so just like our uh, society has a different um, and, uh, mechanisms uh, which focus on different threats so too do the white blood cells. White blood cells can do a lot of things. One of the things that they can do is eat some of these foreign components. That's what's called phagocytosis. And so uh, white blood cells have ways of recognizing uh, microbes uh, then uh, surrounding them. And that's what then some of these granules uh, then do. These granules have digestive enzymes, uh, which can then uh, break uh, the microbes uh, apart. 
White blood cells can do other things as well. White blood cells can start uh, a fever. Uh, they can um, uh, then uh, promote uh, inflammation. And inflammation is, is good when it's uh, controlled. So for example, when there's uh, a fire, for uh, example, um, it's good that uh, we can sound the fire alarm. Uh, that way we all know uh, that there is a problem, you know, that the, the alarm is going off and then the appropriate first responders can arrive, et cetera. In the same way, if white blood cells like basophils, you know, say, hey, there's an emergency here, um, this then inflammation brings uh, the appropriate uh, white blood cells. So as you, we watch, say, response to inflammation here in this video, I'd like you to watch these white blood cells and notice how they're different from red blood cells. Red blood cells are just following the current. They simply go where they are pushed. Um, but the white blood cells, uh, in contrast, uh, much more you know, thinking uh, that they are looking for specific chemicals like inflammatory signals. And um, when there is you know, that in um, these inflammatory signals, um, they will then leave the blood vessels. So even though we call them white blood cells, the reality is that 98% of them aren't in the blood. They've actually left the blood and are in lymph nodes, the spleen, uh, the thymus, uh, or just mucous membranes. And so we have an enormous number of white blood cells in our body. I mean, the lymphocytes alone would weigh as much as the human brain if we put them all into one place. But they're all spread out because they actually have emigrated or left the blood. So white blood cells are capable of both chemotaxis, moving towards certain uh, chemicals like uh, the signals for inflammation. Uh, and then also they can squeeze uh, between the cells lining the blood vessels. Uh, they can perform um, uh, emigration. Now, uh, there are lots of tests that one can do. Not only could one do say a total white blood cell count, uh, which would uh, then uh, give you an idea of, you know, an individual has too many uh, uh, white blood cells. Uh, this uh, could indicate an uh, infection, um, but it could also then potentially indicate like a cancer, uh, uh, like leukemia. So here, for example, are blood slides of patients who had leukemia. And you'll notice that there are more white blood cells than normal. White blood cells are usually uncommon in the blood. Most of them have left the blood. But here you'll see the dark purple. There are a lot of white blood cells. So that could uh, mean that there's an infection. So if you had mono, for example, uh, there would be uh, an increase in the number of monocytes uh, that uh, you had. Um, but then uh, you can also have an uncontrolled production of cells uh, and this is a type of, uh, of cancer affecting blood, uh, blood cells, leukemia. And as you can see here, there's different kinds of uh, leukemia. And so uh, a total white blood cell count could tell you that a patient's um, uh, blood, uh, white blood cells are elevated. And then you'd ask why, since white blood cells can fight infection, that might lead you to believe that, oh, you know, someone has an infection. So that's good to know. Um, but then it can also, once again, be an, uh, a sign of, say, cancer. And here you can see the bone marrow of a patient who had cancer and all those dark purple areas. Um, those are the areas which are producing the white blood cells. And there's far more than uh, normal, uh, which is uh, why there are so many white blood cells than in the blood, because there's a, a cancer in the bone marrow where too many cells are producing um, the, uh, uh, the white blood cells. Um, there are different types of uh, blood tests that one can do. And one last one involving uh, white blood cells is that one uh, could perform a differential white blood cell count. So if each of these white blood cells has a specialty, all right, that neutrophils say are very good at fighting bacteria, eosinophils say parasitic worms, basophils cause inflammation, um, uh, monocytes, you know, can be good against, you know, lots of things, including, you know, bigger things like yeast. Uh, lymphocytes are very good at virally infected cells and, and fighting cancer. Um, then one could uh, say, all right, do we notice in my patient 
any abnormal distribution of these white blood cells. So, for example, if you saw fire trucks going to the house across the street, you would think that there's a fire, right? Because you know the, the fire is, uh, department is responding. If you saw army tanks going to the house across the street, you you would know there was a problem, but you wouldn't think there was a fire. It's something else. In the same way here, a normal person has a certain degree of neutrophils in their blood, you know, maybe 50 to 70%. Um, the normal number of, leukos, of lymphocytes is maybe 20 to 40%. Uh, monocytes, maybe 10 to 15%. And eosinophils and basophils are rarer, maybe 1 or 2% for eosinophils, less than 1% with basophils. And so if this is what a normal person's blood looks like, if your patient's blood has uh, for uh, an excess of neutrophils, that means something. Since neutrophils fight bacteria, then that means you might have a bacterial infection. A high number of lymphocytes mean you might have a viral infection. A high number of eosinophils might mean a parasitic worm. So this is what's called a differential white blood cell count. If you count the relative numbers of these different kinds of white blood cells and you get an abnormal value, um, the reason might then you, you then ask the question why, um, and this is indicative of lots of things that you know you know this would be something you know to pursue later. Uh, but for example, um, eosinophils really shouldn't be in the lungs in appreciable uh, levels. If you're attracting eosinophils to your lungs, that's a sign of asthma, and so both at the beginning stages of asthma, uh, you get higher eosinophils. Um, but also the worse uh, your asthma condition is, the higher the level of eosinophils, so that eosinophil uh, counts you know, could then be indicative of, of a number of issues, for example. So the, just an example where you could get blood work done and your hematocrit could you know, give you information about anemia or you know, blood doping you know, and, and blood pressure and a number of things, whereas you can do different types of white blood cell counts, like a total white blood cell count, or a differential white blood cell count. Um, there's one uh, additional type of uh, cell, uh, which is in um, uh, blood. Uh, those are those uh, platelets, uh, which are produced uh, in uh, the bone marrow from those big bone marrow cells. And platelets have roles in uh, blood clot. Normally, platelets don't stick to each other or to the sides of a blood vessel. They just keep on going. But if we've cut ourselves and we've exposed collagen, then um, platelets uh, will then uh, change their shape. They release their vesicles and they start to form this plug. All right. And then the chemicals that they release from uh, the platelet uh, plug then helps to start off a clotting factor uh, cascade. Now, cascades are complex pathways. So whenever we use the, the term cascade, as we do with um, uh, uh, the immune uh, system, uh, so that there is a complement cascade, or here with um, uh, blood clotting, it means that there's not one single protein involved in a step. So you, know, you have clotting factor 10, which activates clotting factor five, which then activates the next one, which is the next one. So you know, there's a long series of clotting factors, for example. We actually number them up to 12, and then there's additional proteins as well. And what they end up doing is at the end of this cascade, we take a protein which is already in your blood. So about 7% of your plasma proteins are a protein known as fibrinogen. Well, the fibrinogen then gets united into these long strands known as fibrin, and that's what actually makes up the clot. So uh, when platelets release their clotting factors that through a cascade stimulates uh, these little uh, protein subunits, which are already present uh, in your blood, it stimulates them into making these strands uh, of fibrin, which actually form a clot. Uh, now, some of my blood is uh, clotting uh, here. It's time lapse, uh, so you know that uh, uh, it's uh, sped up. But you can see these dark strands forming as uh, the fibrinogen, which was already present in my blood, is now stimulated to uh, form these long chains.
Now, clotting is important, but one important feature is that we vary. I mean, we vary in how tall we are. We vary in our hair color. We vary in our eye color. We also vary in how many clotting factors we produce in a milliliter of blood. If you produce less, then that means uh, that if you were to cut yourself, your blood is slower to clot. So maybe you know, you, know, you would risk a hemorrhage if you're not uh, producing enough uh, clotting uh, factors. And there are a number of bleeding disorders where individuals don't make um, enough uh, of the proteins in those clotting factor uh, cascades. At the other end of the spectrum, however, if you make too much of these clotting factors, if your blood is too quick to clot, um, then that's a problem um, because uh, the um, uh, blood clots can happen even if we haven't cut ourselves. Uh, so if um, uh, you have heart disease and you have, say, a lipid plaque in your blood vessels, platelets uh, can hit that irregular surface and start a clot. Or if a clot starts elsewhere, um, it could now uh, get stuck there. Now, inappropriate clots are bad because then they block blood flow to downstream uh, tissues, causing a heart attack or a stroke. So if a blood clot forms here, it's blocking blood flow and some of my nerve cells will die in a stroke. If that happens in my heart, then some of my heart uh, muscle cells will die in a myocardial infarction, a heart attack. And so while clots are good if we've cut ourselves, we don't want clots to form inappropriately. And so if our blood clotting factor levels are too high, um, and then uh, that's uh, bad uh, because uh, now uh, we're um, at an increased risk for heart attack and, and stroke. So stroke is a major cause of death in the world. Heart attacks are the num and cardiovascular disease, the number one cause of death in uh, the world. If my clotting factor levels were too high, if I've had repeated heart attacks or stroke, uh, then I might take an anticoagulant which would decrease my clotting factor levels. So now I'm, I'm you know, I might be say I'm on an anticoagulant, um, uh, which now uh, reduces my risk of heart attack because I'm making fewer clotting factors. I would bleed more. So if I cut myself, I would I'd bleed more if I'm on an anticoagulant. But that would just be the, the price to pay for you know, reducing heart attack risk. If I was having a, having a heart attack right now um, because of a clot, then I might take a thrombolytic agent that uh, is uh, one that dissolves clots in an effort to dissolve the clot that has already uh, formed. So this was just a quick introduction into some of the components uh, that are present in blood, uh, the red blood cells, the white blood cells, the platelets, uh, what they do, even some of the plasma proteins. But then also because whether it be for yourself or someone you're taking care of, a child, you know, a relative, um, very often blood results come back and, you know, there's the hematocrits, the total white blood cell counts, the differential white blood cell counts, the levels of clotting factors. It's good to have, you know, a basic understanding so that you can make informed healthcare decisions. Um, the next uh, video in this uh, series will then talk about uh, heart, uh, the heart and uh, the ECGs for the same reason.